It's a facility that's already left its mark on Las Vegas entertainment. The Smith Center for the Performing Arts, set to celebrate its first year in operation next month. But now a new attraction has taken up residency. We saw this big, we didn't know what it was. A peregrine falcon claiming the center's 170-foot bell tower as its own. We found out it was a female. She's about 18 to 20 inches tall, and she's beautiful. Groundskeeper Jay Detry first spotted the bird a few months ago, perched overlooking Symphony Park, using the tower, it would seem, as a downtown base camp. We have gone up there a couple times just to check it out and clean up, and there's no actual nest. We're waiting for spring, though, to see, because she has a male boyfriend. She has a little boyfriend. I say little because he's definitely smaller and skinnier than she is. Peregrines are native. They've made a historic comeback. Dave Canales is co-owner of Airborne Raptors Unlimited, a local organization that helps educate the public about birds of prey. This is one of their male peregrines, and Canales says they're more common in Las Vegas than most people think. They use these big casinos as what cliff faces would have been historically before we were here. A nice high area to sit and actually scour the landscape for their favorite thing, pigeons. To give our camera a little demonstration, Canalis lets a trained saker falcon fly. Try to get him to stoop vertical again. This is a behavior that I taught him. Hey! But birds, he points out, are territorial. And just as he calls his bird back, Peregrine falcon right now just came in. Our wild peregrine moves in for a closer look. They won't fight, it's just he's gonna come check it out. He's gonna realize that this isn't a permanent invader to his territory and he'll just go about his business when we pull out of here. So now that the bird is here, many are asking what's her name? Well, on the Smith Center Facebook page, well over 100 fans are already chiming in. Suggestions like Smitty, Bell, and Quasimodo in honor of the keeper of another famous bell tower. A final decision though, has yet to be made. As for Detry, it is absolutely cool. He's hoping the Falcon will have a lifetime engagement, wowing audiences who expect great things at the Smith Center. That's our bird story. Denise Rosh, News 3. This is the Moapa Cemetery. Uh, Vicki Simmons yeah, uh, believes the old Moapa in, uh, Indian Cemetery is full morning, of people who died from exposure to what she calls Indian, poison air uh, since Indian the Reed Gardner coal Indian plant Indian fired up in 1965 within walking distance to her home. This is, these two are my neighbors. They both worked at the power plant. Simmons. Her whole family is not even there. They're just like, they're gone. They're all di they all died. Comes to this place to investigate. He had black lung and emphysema. Joining others on the reservation who tell a similar story of sickness since 65. Cancer, uh, heart attacks, high blood pressure. Tribal members believe the coal ash produced by Reed Gardner's burners has poisoned their water, their land, and the air in and out of their homes. NV Energy admits fly ash contains arsenic, lead, and other metals, but says they are technically not toxic and not hazardous. Others say those elements can be toxic. Tribal member Earl Begay says his neighbor's health conditions prove the air is toxic. Asthma, asthma, definitely asthma, asthma, and that person's already deceased. One of Begay's neighbors, Russell Sampson, who lives in the house closest to Reed Gardner's stacks. Sampson's breathing. Yeah, because my chest hurts right up in here. Is clearly difficult. His lungs, anything but clear. These are the medicines right here. Two fistfuls of pills. Yeah. All because of the power plant? Uh huh. Yeah. The Sierra Club of Nevada cataloging stories like Samson's. Collecting photographs taken near Samson's home. Days when the Sierra Club says emissions choke the health right out of Moapa air. See the cloud coming right at you, you know, the wind blowing at you. It, you know, it's not the dirt dust, it's white dust coming towards you, and you can see it. Stories like these getting the attention of the Environmental Protection Agency, listening closely to hearings held on the Moapa Reservation. I have an allergist, I have a cardiologist that I see, I have a nef nephrologist and an endocrinologist. I'm only 47. Our children can't play outside anymore. It just, we just can't. 
We, we want to keep our kids. Tribal Environmental Director Darren DeBoda says the commonality of symptoms tell the story. Oh yeah, we had the same symptoms, the same ca uh, casualties of death that are not reported um, to us in our community. But in the outside community, you know, now they're coming forward, breathing this air, it's on our clothes, it's on our cars, our vehicles, it's in our household. NV Energy continues to tell tribal members the air is safe because of $80 million retrofits and that NV Energy is a good neighbor. Tribal members feel NV Energy is simply running out the clock. And so if you know we lose our um, membership, there's going to be no more tribe. This is a story of a former gangbanger named Seven. For years, he worked the streets selling drugs, pimping women, and doing drive-bys. It's a story of an angry man with no remorse until he faces death. Now a rapper with a message to glorify God, not gangs. 32-year-old Seven grew up in a Sacramento neighborhood. You don't realize what a cult it is. He was initiated by his homies into the Bloods at 13. It gets in, in your mind, you know, it affects the way you think. His story is a reoccurring one for many that are in gangs. Poverty plays a major fact in this, you know, you're growing up with nothing. You know, I remember the first crime I ever committed, it wasn't for the gang. It was because I got tired of people making fun of me because I had beat up shoes. Involved in all types of criminal activity, selling drugs, committing robberies, and even pimping girls, Seven did whatever was necessary to make money. I definitely regret the moments when I knew something was, was wrong to do, but I didn't say nothing. Um, I definitely regret every time that, that my conscience was telling me don't do this and I did it anyway. After years of living the gang life, he went into a downhill spiral of depression. I had a gun and I, I, um, I put the gun in my face. I ended up pulling the trigger, but I hadn't just in whatever me being absent minded, praise God, you know, I never chambered around. The gun empty of bullets. It was a defining moment in Seven's life. I felt a love from God that I ain't never felt. And I've, I mean, it, 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 it changed my heart. Changed his heart so much so that. And Friday I was at school with a sack and a pistol, and on Monday, I was at school with a Bible. Today, he works with Pastor Chris Chapel of Casa de Luz, House of Light. We differentiate between what gang life would be or street life would be compared to what, what they can be. Even though leaving the gang life has been a process for seven, he uses his story to lead other young gang members away from the life of death and destruction. I got a couple young homies that I'm really working with. And I'm trying, like, I can tell they, they, they know what they're doing is wrong. Um, they definitely don't want to suffer the ultimate consequence. He knows this path all too well. If you ask him, yo, do you want to die? No. Do you want to go, do you want to do life in prison like your big homie? No. His work has helped many. We've seen hundreds of cats quit, quit that lifestyle, you know, and doing what we do. Seven says these kids need unconditional love, not someone looking from the outside and judging them. We do change. Um, we need help. You know what I'm saying? We're not going to beg for it. Get out here and put your cleats on this turf and make a difference or shut up. Because you, if you ain't a part of the solution, you are part of the problem. Seven escaped the underworld of gang of violence, but many don't or can't. And while he says the gang that once gave him protection, a sense of belonging, he knows that was a false sense of reality. Fatima Ramatula, News 3. Sit down lower, girls. At 28 years old, Arkady Sergeyev knows what it takes to succeed. Where is our pushes? An ice dancing coach at the Las Vegas Ice Center, he's competed for his native rush-up at some of the biggest events in the world, now passing on what he knows to the next generation. Some of girls are very talented here, yeah. Just need to prove their talent. That's a lot of work. And this week, it's an American dream team his students are raving about. 
Marilyn and Charlie were amazing. Meryl Davis and Charlie White, the first Americans in history to win gold for ice dancing. Turns out Sergei and his former partner once beat the pair. Once in my life, yeah. <laughs> During the 2006 Junior World Championships in Slovenia. He was actually behind me, third place. I was second and that Canadian guy who was second place on Olympic Games, he was first that, that day. Today, Sergei and his wife Valeria, an ice dancer herself, call the American Olympic performance simply outstanding. And they hope it brings a new interest to the sport. You're watching them and you can't believe what they're doing. <laughs> I'm like first lift and then long program and I'm like every time I'm watching I'm like whoo. But one thing the sport does need more of, including here in Las Vegas, is more young men. There are girls looking for qualified partners. And one possible solution can be found right out here. Hockey players who are willing to make the transition. Exactly what Charlie White did. You have to have a strong man. It's not girl sport only. For a country still cheering this ice dancing victory. Denise Raj. USA! USA! News 3. USA. From the air, it looks like any other job site near Lake Mead. But the real work isn't being done up here. We need to take an elevator ride, 640 feet, straight down to get to the meat of this project, a ride not for the claustrophobic. You arrive at the bottom to find a well-lit cavern with several workers. More than 100 people are working on this project in three shifts, continuously, around the clock, six to seven days a week, and it's dangerous. A year and a half ago, Tommy Turner lost his life down here in an accident. Stickers on the side of helmets, a reminder of Tommy and the perils of the job. This is one of the most difficult construction projects in the world right now. I admire those men that go down into that tunnel every day. Uh, it is risky work, it is dangerous work, it is hard work. Um, and this community owes them a huge debt of gratitude. It's a multi-year, $817 million project to build a three-mile tunnel underneath Lake Mead. As lake levels are forecasted to drop, possibly below the only two current straws, an intake at the bottom of the lake is necessary to keep the water flowing to Las Vegas. It's obvious we're under the lake. You notice a steady drip, drip, drip of water coming from the ceiling. There's also a train down here. They call this the Loki, short for locomotive heading down the tracks at 10 miles an hour. It'll take less than 10 minutes to travel a mile and a half. Our trip down the tracks gives us clear evidence of their progress. This was all rock and sand and gravel and mud a short time ago. Now it's a 20 foot high tunnel lined with concrete rings and pipes. And if everything goes as planned, this will be filled with water next year to satisfy a thirsty Las Vegas with water from the deepest part of Lake Mead. We've arrived at our destination. This entire structure is the tunnel boring machine. It's as long as two football fields. The drill head is 600 feet in that direction. It'll take us less than five minutes to walk there. It's a complex machine that was built in Germany specifically for this project. Here's what the cutter head looked like before it was installed. You can get an idea of how it cuts through rock from this film circa 1970 when the first intake was completed. This current project is much more complex than that original tunnel. This is the end of the line for us as far as the let us go, but about 60 feet in that direction is the actual cutter head. They're not cutting anything today because they're doing some maintenance, but on a good day, they can go 100 feet forward. There is little margin for error. Sometime next year, this tunnel will have to hook up with an intake on the bottom of Lake Mead. And how close do you have to get to that intake? <laughs> well, we have about a foot of clearance on either side. What? You're gonna go, you're gonna tunnel underground for three miles and you gotta be within a foot when you get there? Yes, yeah, so we're gonna hit that target and basically they're gonna drive the machine right into the intake structure. Hopefully. Yes, hopefully, <laughs> yes. Channel 3 is making the trip to the intake thanks to a Sharpie. As tradition holds, we, along with many others, were allowed to sign the tunnel boring machine three and a half years ago. It's Lake Meter bust for a thirsty Las Vegas. Dana Wagner, News 3.
So we are well inside the reed gardener plant. When escorted through the coal plant, Moapa Paiute say poisons their air. NV Energy insisted we wear protective lenses and earplugs. No air masks provided because despite the dust, our cameras caught blowing hundreds of feet in the air. NV Energy says... The air up here on a 365 uh, day year is better than it is down there. Still, having interviewed Moapa Paiutes, who provided photos of white dust they say comes from Reed Gardner's coal plant, we wondered about the safety of the dust we walked through. Dust that ended up in our shoes, on our clothes, and inside our car. We took that dust to FX Lab in Las Vegas. Days later, their results from Nevada certified chemist Javier Suarez. The concentrations are higher than what I would expect. If you were exposed to these chemicals, or most of these are elements, there they would be toxic. If this material gets up in the air, um, in my opinion, it would, it would not be healthy. The EPA interested in knowing if the concentrations at the coal plant rise to dangerous levels. The Moapa Paiutes arguing sustained exposure from these elements blowing in the wind are what's making them sick. The Paiutes, though, providing no medical expert to confirm their claims. This got to my uh inside my chest, to my lungs, or I couldn't breathe. We are paying that price, literally with our lives. Last year, we averaged one death every two months. NV Energy sent News 3 their lab's findings. The numbers they provide, drastically different from our lab's findings. Our samples showing 31 parts per million chromium, theirs shows the number 1.1. Our sample showing 4.1 parts per million arsenic, theirs reads, non-detectable. NV Energy explaining their sample came from inside their bag houses and asserts that is the best place to collect the sample. Our sample came from material laying next to the bag houses on the ground and seen blowing up into the air. Air, one chemist says, he wouldn't do business in. If I had this kind of exposure in my lab laboratory, I would evacuate the laboratory until it got cleaned out. The EPA conducting studies of their own, which will include science and testimony from Moapa Paiutes. News 3 learning a ruling is coming within days that will further put the squeeze on NV Energy. And while the EPA studies and NV Energy works to respond, Moapa Paiutes, like Russell Sampson, wait. I think they should do, close the whole thing down because, you know, it's affecting all, not only me, but the young kids. It's a symbol of death. Slowly but surely, we're all dying off. Some of us won't be here much longer, and I put, think I put a lot of tribal members in the grave early.